Church, will you join me in welcoming the whole planet Earth to Big Time Burleson, Texas? Y'all, this is the Open Door Experience Boat. <laughs> that is outstanding. Friends, I want to just welcome you here to Open Door and tell all of our first-time visitors I love you and all the people that are here today. Just God bless you so much. Thank you all for fighting through whatever it was that you've been fighting through to get here. And I want to start off by telling you that this last week I was doing a bunch of podcasts and uh, I was invited to be on some other people's TV shows and it's always such a great opportunity, man, for that to happen. And I was asked a question that I just thought was brilliant and this lady asked me a question and she said, Pastor Troy, where do you see some great moves of, some great moves of the Holy Ghost happening at today? And that's a really good question. Because God Almighty will highlight different places at different times and different seasons. And like sometimes God, you know, just moving in a powerful way in, in outreaches or maybe in prisons or I don't know, maybe in churches, maybe among the youth or something like that. But I couldn't help but just say, I know that there is a move of God taking place right now. And there is a great revival that is coming that has to do with families that families are a place that the Lord is telling us, hey, I really need churches to not see families as the families are here for the church, but rather to see the church as the church is here for the families. And we're changing a lot of wineskins here at Open Door to accommodate this great move of God that we truly believe is coming in an incredible way. Uh, we've completely redone our children's church. We're completely, we have completely redone our youth ministry. Uh, we have the young prophets ministry within our house. Um, our young adults ministry is incredible. Guys, we're building, do you guys know that we're built a brand new resource for homeschooling families? Do you guys know that? And we're starting that here in just a few weeks. And uh, we, we, you know, uh, 175 kids are going to be here several days a week uh, in a university model type thing where we got real teachers and real mentors and people really helping our families educate their kids. Another thing, too, that we're doing is we are putting together tons and tons of resources for the godly teachers and administrators that are already in our school systems to support them and to bless them and help them because they're out there in the midst of a very hostile place. And to encourage them and go, please don't quit. Please stay there. I, man, well, listen, we need you in there. Man, we want to be actively involved in our school board systems and make sure that the godly teachers that are in our schools are actually supported by their boards and not ran out. And like, we're looking at all these kinds of things now. And there, there have been so many school teachers and are so many who have done countless years of service and they are out there every single day and their ministry is just as legitimate as my ministry is here. And one of the things I'm finding is that we, not only do we have to rescue kids, we got to rescue the rescuers who are rescuing kids. Amen. So we want to build ministries that are rescuing the rescuers around us. And that's, that's one, if, if you are gonna ask me, how can you guys be so effective throughout the world and do all the things that you do throughout the world? Because our first priority is to rescue the rescuers. And it's been like that for 30 years. Like how in the world could you build all these infrastructures that have all these ministries and 13 leprosy villages and you know, six to 8,000 kids in your homes right this second and rescue over 10,000 boys and girls out of sexual slavery? How in the world could you dig over 100 water wells every single year? How in the world, we could just go on and on and on and on and on. It's because we found the people that always wanted to do those things who were in those places that were only doing this much because nobody in the world would partner with them. And we stepped up and said, our first priority is to rescue the rescuers, the indigenous peoples in this part of the world who don't need us to Americanize them. They need us to bring the kingdom and to love them and to support them. And that's how. Well, guys, we want to continue to do that. And we want to build ministries to support those people that are already doing this. And we also want to continue to rescue kids. And we are. And we're not going to back off. Why? Because why are you got such an emphasis towards families now? And why are you changing so many wineskins of Open Door Church and just making it a, a giant family resource place? Why are you doing that? Because the world is trying to kill your kids is why. 
And before the world kills your kids, they want to sex them up and sexualize them and destroy their minds, their identities, destroy any hope they have and bring so much shame upon them. And then I'll just go on to the next generation. We're saying no to that. We're saying no, and we believe that we have something as the body of Jesus to actually say about this. And the idea that we're just gonna just sit around while the culture destroys our families and destroys our children is ludicrous. We're gonna get up, amen? We're gonna get up. So a big part of all the ministries we're doing now is just to simply provide environments that are, are not trying to sexualize your kids. And those, those places are hard to find. It's hard to watch, you can't even watch, you can't even watch television commercials anymore without being taught a sexual liberal lesson. You can't, you can't even watch a, a, a commercial, an Oreo commercial. We're like, what the heck? Like, would you please not teach my children that or, or my grandkids that? Because we love Oreos. <laughs> We're like, what the heck? Or we could just go through the litany of all of this and like, we have to set up environments where nobody in the environments is after their kids except for to help them and to love them and to, and to support their families that are raising them. And it's very hard to find that anymore. It's incredibly difficult. And guys, it's becoming more and more and more difficult. One of the things that they do, that our enemies do, and you need to know, friends, that you have enemies. And they're gonna say, you are the hater if you do not allow them to come in and devour your life. They insist that you allow them to devour them and they tell you what they wanna do and how they wanna do it. And then when you tell everybody what they said they're going to do, they call you a hater. It's a crazy, it, you're like, well, that would never work. It works when the media is on your side. And so we see it happening. We see it happening all the time where people will literally stand in the shambles of something, uh, in a giant mess that they are creating, that they are continuing to push forward, a horrible, horrible mess while they declare how pristine and how much order there is in the midst of it. While they're standing in the ruins of what they have created, they're telling us how wonderful that environment actually is. I saw this here two weeks ago, you know, where the leader of our nation actually stood up in the midst of this recession that you and I are living in right now and declared it's a historically robust economy. And I'm like, what? I'm like, well, he must not have to buy groceries. He don't. He must not have to buy gas. He don't. He must not run a food bank. He doesn't. You know, it's like, he, he, must not, he must not actually be involved in the lives of retired people. He's not. He ain't, he ain't retired. And it's like, well, we have this completely different reality while we're being told by people in authority that this is the reality and we insist that you say that your reality is this or we're gonna call you a hater. And it's been, a, it's been an amazing thing for us to deal with, all of us, as people who, who have families and as people who love our country and as people who, as, as, as people that, you know, we, we wanna be polite. And the Texas culture works like this. Let's be polite, and if you're not polite to me, I'm gonna crack your face. And, and there's this, I'm not saying it's right, I'm just telling you that that's Texas culture. And, and I'm not, it's like we have this really weird deal where we like, oh, you're not gonna be nice? No, no, you will be nice. And like, you will not honk at me. It is a horrible and terrible offense for me to be honked at. I immediately think, this person's out to kill me. I have to defend myself. Because if I honk at you, it's the equivalent of saying a really bad word. Well, people in other cultures do not live like that. And as all these other cultures have invaded Texas, we've had to learn, oh, well, they're just knuckleheads. That's what they do. And they don't speak our same language of if you honk at me, I'm pulling my pistol out. And so it's, we're all having to deal with that, right? We're all just having to deal with the clash of cultures and we gotta learn how to deal with each other. But, and so if somebody calls us hateful or ugly or something like that, 
man, we, I, I don't know, but it just pegs my cringe meter. I don't want anybody to think I'm hateful or ugly. But if I spot that, wait, this is the real true experience of humanity in this part, and you are the one that's causing it, and you're declaring it's something else, I should be able to call you on that. What do you do when a guy from CNN stands in the midst of buildings that are burning by Atifa while they're having a riot and declare, it's a peaceful, it's a peaceful demonstration? <laughs> Did you guys see that? He's like, what? You're standing in the midst of a mob that is burning the town down. Like, what is it? Well, we have the right to redefine things now, and you have to define them the way that we define them. And I'm just like, my goodness. Now look, you know, you deal with this. You deal with this in your house. You deal with this with your kids. You deal with this in your family. You deal with this in your medical choices now. And you're not allowed to call anybody on anything. Okay, here's another thing too. It amazes me during the sixth month, all month long, we have to deal with this statement that is in every form of media that we have. And it's this family friendly gay pride parades. While those, while those monsters are yelling obscenities at the children that are there, telling them, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, mom, dad, let me have your kid. They're like, well, this is very safe for my family. And they're like, that what's, what is wrong with you? Why would you do that? You just wanna be cool? Why would you take your kids to that and expose that to your children? Why would you let those men talk to your babies like that? Well, I wanna tell you what it is. It's folks saying, I'm willing to sacrifice my kids as long as people don't call me a hater. That's how bad it is. It has nothing to do with the reality of the, uh, guys, the situation. I was in Seattle here a few months ago, and I wanna tell you, I saw one of those parades, and it was, I don't even wanna describe it. And people had their kids standing on there waving flags while these guys watched right up and did them the most obscene things you can possibly imagine without a single stitch of clothes on. And parents were out there telling them, hey listen, hey, listen, we don't wanna be hateful. We have to be in agreement with this. Well, 1 John 3, 7 says, little children, make sure that nobody deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous. And the people that ain't, ain't. Romans, 12, Romans chapter 12, verse two says, and do not be conformed to this world, but rather be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's like, you're not gonna know God's heart if you're with a, if you're with a mob. If you run with the crowd, you're not gonna know even what's right anymore. Isaiah chapter five, verse 20 Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who, who say bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter, who tell you this will be healthy for your children to be a part of this. They don't care about the consequences of it because they don't care about you and they don't care about your kids. The same exact people that are causing the chaos are selling something that they say is the answer. And here we are, but hey, we're nice people and we love our nation and we're godly people. And look, we don't wanna just be causing problems, you know? We don't wanna be, we don't wanna go around causing problems. You know, I mean, I wanna get along with people. And then what's real is you find out amongst your enemies, you can't get along with them unless you allow them to dominate you. First Corinthians 15, says, do not be deceived because bad company corrupts good morals. Meaning this, if you go with the wrong crowd, you will forget what is even right and what is even wrong. And you're gonna have to, make, you're gonna have to decide either to come out of that crowd and to lose your position and your place among those, free, uh, among those people or to actually know what's right, what's wrong, what is harmful and what is, and what is good for you. Today, there's such a new sexual standardization and there's such an agenda. You know, it's so whack and it's so messed up that if in the workplace, guys, I wanna just talk, to, I don't wanna just talk to the men here for just a second. Guys, do you understand that in the workplace right now, it is illegal and rightfully so, and you could be prosecuted and rightfully so, if you sexually, um, let's see this, if you sexually harass your female uh, workers or the people that actually work with you, and rightfully so. 
But I want to tell you this, not only is it legal, but it is recommended that a monster can go to your five-year-old and sexually harass them and convince them that they are even a different gender. And then if they're like, okay, you know, I'm just trying, okay, yeah, I think maybe, you know, I might be a girl. They're like, quick, 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 get them hormones, get them medicine. Let's jump on this thing. It's the equivalent of taking a five-year-old little boy who says he wants to be a pirate when he grows up and poking out their eye and putting an eye patch on Who would do that? Who in the world would do that? Who in the world would say it's cool if your little girl says, I want to be a unicorn, that you put her to sleep and nail something into her forehead and completely change who she is, what she does, and how she identifies? Who would agree with that? Oh, I'm going to tell you, the whole world that you live in today will agree with that as long as it, as long as it fits their sexual agenda for your children. Well, there are people now that are being victimized within these environments that they have created and insisted you can't be a part of anything social unless you're a part of this environment. And then once you're victimized in it, they say you shouldn't have drank at the party or you wouldn't have been raped. This is what they do. And the people of God need to wise up to this. And, and, and I wanna just tell you, I got on the internet and was looking for I was looking for preaching on this. I could find John and Lisa Bervere, who have amazing things on the things that I'm talking about today, but I wanna tell you nothing but silence. A lot of the silence is because it doesn't fit the algorithms and when people speak against this, it disappears on the internet. That's, that's a lot of it and I wanna say this. But also too, I don't hear anybody even talking about pornography anymore. Nobody even talks about it. I, I, nobody wants to talk about it because it's all such a big part of all of our lives. And we're gonna feel like great big hypocrites if we've seen pornography and actually go, we do realize that this is killing us, right? Like, well, we don't wanna get off into that because it's a really big deal. I wanna tell you the reason why we're having to save little boys and little girls and the reason why um, so many, it's okay for so many people to bring sexualization against your children is because the entire world is addicted to pornography. And I'm talking about addicted to pornography. And it's become such a big, huge part of our culture today and such a monster part of how we even socialize with each other, from how kids deal with each other to how kids actually get together, what they talk about, how they interact. And then of course it goes into high school and then it goes into college and then it goes into relationships and marriages. It's become such a huge part of it that honestly, we're, we're right at the brink of not being able to even separate our own sexuality outside of a pornographic realm to not be able to feel like a man unless you're involved in some kind of pornography, to not to be able to feel like you're a woman unless you submit to the image, which is always about a male dominating you. Which these same people that say that they're all about women's rights, they will push that trash all day long and be happy for you to be chewed up, spit out, and on drugs for the rest of your life because of the shame of the abuse that you've gone through and what you said okay to. This stuff is designed to kill you. It's designed, to, it's designed to destroy your family. It's designed for you to be so messed up that you become hopeless. But friends, I wanna tell you, I've got good news. Jesus Christ is here today. And the word of God is true. And there are very good boundaries and clear boundaries and there's a right way to live. I'm not asking anybody here to sign up to be a eunuch because this brother is not signing up for that. I mean, <laughs> I promise you. I promise you, I'm a passionate individual and I love my bride, I promise you. But I, I wanna tell you, I will not apologize for being a sexual dude. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna apologize for that. That comes with a package of me being a dude. And I'm not gonna be ashamed of it because everybody else makes that to be a shameful thing. And if you're hoping I'm a eunuch, you go to some other church or some other eunuch pastor because it ain't gonna be me. And if you're also hoping that I'm not a porn, that I am not a part of pornography, and if you think that you deserve, if, if all the guys in here, if you feel like, you know, I think I deserve to have a pastor that doesn't lust, lust after my wife, you do. I don't want to lust after your wife. Ladies, I don't want any woman at all to ever get a bad vibe from me that they don't feel like that they can trust me or whatever because I'm just, you know, thinking something bad all the time. I hate that. No, I do not walk in that. But I wanna tell you, it's been a fight. 
It's been a fight, it's been a fight, it continues to be a fight, and I'm in the fight, and I'm asking all the other dudes in this place to join me in that fight. The father of pornography is a guy by the name of Hugh Hefner. He recently died. I don't have anything else to say about that. 1953, he came out, Brother Hugh did, he came out with Playboy magazine, and it was a classy, pornographic, still pictured magazine. And he came out and said, you know, really, see, man, we're the good guys. This is for expression. This is part of the sexual revolution. Um, women are actually able now to express their bodies. Guys are actually now able to engage in this kind of stuff. And there's not anything shady going on. And I want to tell you, they're all liars. There's all kinds of investigations that are going on right now of all the children that have been molested in the Playboy Mansion. Of course there was children being molested in the Playboy Mansion. Of course there was. And while, while these mamas were a part of being celebrated because they were the slaves to this system, their children were also enslaved. And we can't, of course that was happening. Anybody with any sense knows that that's what happens within these sexual environments. We do know that, right? If you think that anybody's like, hey man, we just keep this all above board and we got this really sexually charged environment and all these beautiful girls and all these rich people coming here. If you think that that is the way that they portray it, my goodness, how you don't understand. And so like, well, how do you know? Because I rescue boys and girls out of that trash. Because I do. And I've seen it all over the world and I've seen it for 30 years. I've seen, I have been sickened at my own propensity for pornography and knowing, man, I could get off into that really bad. And knowing this as a young man and even all the way up to my age right now, and I'm 55, and knowing that still, if I let my guard down, I could go and be a part of that. And if that makes you mad, then go get a robot to get up here and let, let, let a robot preach. I am a dude, but I promise you, and I give you my word as a man of God, I put my foot down with that trash. And I do. And I'm like, I don't want that in my life because I know what it actually is. And I also know what it'll do to my marriage. I know what it'll do to my own sexuality. I know, I know what it'll do. And I know what it does to people. It is not a victimless thing at all. And just to be able to deal with the fact that it's not victimless. All that comes from the sexual revolution, which the people who led the sexual revolution in the 60s declared consequence-free indulgence. That is a lie. It is not consequence-free. It is a total lie. There is a price that is paid not only by the people who are perpetrating such things, but by the victimization of the people who are actually involved in it. And it's like, okay, well, we need to be, but nobody even looks into it anymore. Why? because of everybody's porno addiction. And I, I'm not here to throw any stones at anybody, but I wanna just tell you what pornography was in 1953 is not what it is today. It is something completely different. Since online porn has become, since the 1990s, whenever the internet hit, and then there soon after, whenever online porn became available with the, with the birth of the smartphone, for the first time, people could be involved and, with, and actually, actually see and hear the worst sexual content that you can possibly imagine from any race of people in any regional location, and actually nobody would know, and they'd say, well, there's no consequences and there is no accountability. Once that faucet was turned on, it unleashed something into our families and into our societies that wants to tear down the structure of everything. If you see somebody who's willing to tear down the structure of your family, I promise you they're willing, they willing to tear down the structure of our nation. I promise you, because they hate those things. And I'm gonna say it one more time. I know that everybody in this room has seen pornography. You know that I have seen pornography. I'm not, here to, I'm not here to throw stones at anybody, but I am here telling you right now that you can actually be a part of the solution without being a part of the problem. You can. And, and, and most people are not brave enough to actually deal with this. I would love for our youth group that there not be one single taboo issue with any single teenager that is dealing with, with pornography. I would love it to be so real and so honest and say, hey, we are so real about seeing you healed and set free 
that there is no shame here whatsoever. This is a part of this life. Now, let's you and I take a part by making a stand for King Jesus. And I want to, I believe it, I'm going to see it. I believe it, I'm going to see it. One year from now, you're going to tell me I've gone a whole year without any form of, without any form of pornography within my life. Two years from now, you're going to be able to do that. As a matter of fact, I'm fixing to add something to, to troybrewer.com where people can actually sign up for that and say, I'm going to celebrate this day. People, people that haven't been a part of it for years and years and years to be able to mark a day and say, I want to be able to say a year from now, I've had an entire year without any form of pornography within my life. Just taking a proactive stance and just being declaring, I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to be a part of that. Well, if you want to know about how bad it actually is and how much time people are spending on it. Pornhub, which is one of the leading porn sites in the world, claimed that in 29, that in 2019, and guys, these are their own numbers, it had 42 billion visits with 39 billion searches. That's 115 million a day, almost 5 million an hour, almost 80,000 a minute, and that's just one site, one site. That's not two porn sites, that's one. One site. And like, okay, to put that in perspective, in the time that it takes for you to hear this message, more than 250,000 people are gonna be watching pornography on this one site. On one site, not on 50 sites, not on 30 sites, but on this one site. And like, this is how big of a problem it is. And again, we're not answering it in the body of Jesus because we're scared of it. And I don't want to be afraid of this. Man, I want to swat the hornet's nest when it comes to this thing because it's after our families. As of 2019, and again, guys, these are part of their numbers. They had, as of, 29, as of 2019, porn home estimates, 12, let me find it here, guys. Pornhub estimates 12,500 gigabytes per minute, enough to fill the memories of every smartphone on the planet Earth of people uploading their own pictures. 12,500 gigabytes per minute, enough to fill up the memory of every smartphone on the planet Earth every single minute. You're like, what? What? Can I tell you this? 88% of all pornography includes some form of terrible violence. 88% of all pornography has violence. And I'm talking some bad violence. But only 12% of it is consensual. Do you understand that? Do you understand that if your husband or your wife or your kids are watching pornography four to six hours a day as millions and millions and millions of Americans are? Do you know that if that's going on, that his brain is being trained, that his sexuality, that his sexuality is about attacking women and beating the snot out of them until finally it gets to a place where you're attacking children and beating the snot out of them? Do you know that? That's disgusting. That's scary. That needs to cause every single one of us to go, whoa, 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 stop, stop, stop. I've tried to avoid this, but they came into my lane. They, they showed up in my house with my kids, showed up, showed up trying to show up in my marriage. They showed up in my lane and, oh, no, 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 we're not going to go this route. We're not going to do this. So... I'm going to help you over the next five minutes know how to deal with this, and I'm going to show you two different things. Number one, we, if, we have, if we turn to the Lord in this, and if we have a deep reliance upon the Lord in the midst of this, I'm telling you right now, God Almighty will give us simple solutions to complicated issues. And if you're like, no, I don't think so. One of them is this, don't let your kids have a, a device on them 24 seven. And if you're letting them do that, you are throwing them to the wolves. You are teaching your little girls that this is what it's like to be an adult. And I promise you, there is a, a whole room full of grown men that would be happy to accommodate her. I promise you. 
You're teaching your little boys how to be abusive towards other women. You're teaching them that. You're like, well, I'm not teaching them that. It's something bad on the internet. Right, turn it off. If they're going to, I, I'm about to just start going off on simple solutions. One of those simple solutions is this. If you're on the web, I get to see what it is that you're watching. And if I can't do that, then no. Hey guys, would you allow, would you allow your 12 year olds to talk to any teenage boy about whatever they wanted to talk about whenever they wanted to talk, talk about? If you say no, I'd say very good for you and that makes you part of the minority, but why would you turn them over to something even worse than that? Why would you do that? Because you don't realize how bad it is. And I'm trying to tell you, it's bad. Now, I can tell you this, that when it comes to our reliance upon the Lord, that we have to have this total reliance upon him and say, wait, I gotta come back to God and I've gotta get with God's program on this and I gotta find out what does the Lord say about my sexuality? What does the Lord say about how we introduce sexuality within our house? And by the way, are you gonna determine who gets to introduce sexuality to your children or are you gonna leave that up to the government or to the internet? Are you just gonna turn that over to some pedophile and trust them with that? I hope not, but most of America will. Most of America will literally sacrifice their children so that they are not called haters. Don't do it, that's bell worship. That's what that is, don't do it. So now that I told you this, let me just, let me throw this out there. You know, I started off with the scripture, Psalm 73 verse 26. My flesh and my heart fell, but God is the strength of my heart and he is my portion forever. Okay, I'm not very smart in this. I, I don't know this. I tried to figure it out, I failed. I tried to make a stand, I failed. I tried to do this, I failed. All right, here's the deal. God Almighty is your strength. And I'm gonna cut to the end of this and I'm gonna say this, that the, that the road to holiness is through sanctification. So like, what is that? Sanctification is the road to holiness. Like, what is that? It means this, it's the action or the process of being freed, but it's also the process of deliberate action upon our part. So what are you talking about? If something is sanctified, and I think we changed that a little bit, but I'm just gonna say this, that if something is sanctified, it means it belongs to the Lord. The first thing is this, understand this, do not be ashamed of your sexuality. Guys, I wanna tell you, man, married sex should not be an oxymoron. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, whatever. Bunch of hypocrites. I'm not scared of y'all. I'm not scared of anybody. I can tell you, like, oh, okay. Like, no, that's true. We, we're not hoping for an awesome sex life. Man, you're a liar, man. So I am. And here's what I'm saying this. Married sex should not be an oxymoron. I mean, we should be, people should be able to look at us and go, man, those people are cool, man. Those people got it going on. I mean, those people really love each other. Like, dang, that is awesome, right? But I wanna just tell you, you have to agree and you have to believe this thing belongs to the Lord. It doesn't just belong to me. And I have to set this thing apart for service of the Lord, which means I'm not free to think this. I'm not free to engage in this. I'm not free to be involved in that. I gotta sanctify it. In other words, I'm like, uh, this belongs to the Lord. And then holiness is the next step of that. It's when God shows up in it. Amen. Are you guys with me on that? So I want to just tell you, the very, there was actually a sexual revolution that took place way before the American sexual revolution, and it didn't happen here in America. It happened in Rome. Like when? What happened? Rome was a horrible, disgusting culture when it comes to sexual things. <laughs> um, they were into slavery. They loved enslaving people. They loved making people sexual slaves. Um, pedophilia was a big part of the Roman culture. Grown men um, involved in sexual relationships with little boys and little girls, mostly little boys. Uh, prostitution was legal, and by 100 AD, um, Rome itself had no less than 45 government-sponsored brothels that was full of slaves from nations that they had conquered, including Israel in 70 AD. And it was just part of, it was part of a society that was terrible. The culture was unbelievable. It was, it, I, I can't imagine how hard it was to deal with because Roman sexuality was all about violent male dominance. Sounds like pornography today. And then, Rome, and then Roman sexuality was also a big part. It led to um, sexualizing or the sexualization of children. And that was a part of the success. That was it. Okay, that's 
what pornography is today, and that's what's happening in America today. So if you think it's hard today to make a stand in the midst of your terrible culture, imagine how hard it was for Christians 2,000 years ago who lived in Rome, who gave their hearts to King Jesus in every single part of their social life, of their public life, of their voting life. It all had to do with some form of perverse sexuality. If you think it's hard for you to stand up against a culture today, imagine how brave it must have been for the Christians that lived in ancient Rome. Yet, they were not swallowed up by their culture. We're here today and Rome is not. And we're here today because they decided they were gonna find out. They had this joker by the name of Paul that came into the mix and he started writing books like 1 Corinthians and he started defining that our sexuality is actually a kingdom thing. That you don't, separate, you don't separate it from the kingdom, you actually make it a part of the kingdom and it's all about the kingdom. And you guys can go through my notes and you can find uh, all my notes on that and I'll show you that if you guys are willing to have my notes. But what happened is this. By the time that the church got done with that culture, and they simply, they simply did this, who does God say that I am? How does God say I'm supposed to live? And, and who does God say I'm supposed to be sexually? And let's do that. And they outlived the political culture and the sensual culture that they lived in, and they actually changed it. By the time that the Christians were done, uh, they constrained predator men, they liberated women, and they protected children. And that was a complete reverse of the Roman culture. I want to close by saying this, and, and again, I want to say this. Guys, they had the same word of God that we have. They had the same Holy Spirit that we have. And they were in a much more hostile culture than you and I are in. And there is no reason for you and I to bow down to this. There is no reason for us to give up and give up our families. There's no reason for us to do that. We have to be brave, we have to believe the word of God. We gotta stand where Jesus tells us to stand. And if we haven't been standing there, repent. And go, it's time for me to stand here in this place. Numbers chapter 25, Israel found itself in an environment that it didn't know how to handle. Now they were supposed to be in the promised land, but because of doubt and unbelief, they ended up having to track through the wilderness and they end up in this land of the Midianites. And then they came through the camp of the Moabites. The Moabites had a very, very, very sexual and sensual culture. And they were something else. And the Israelites never dealt with anything like that. And these, these people were beautiful and they knew what they were doing. They knew the language, they knew how to look, they knew how to act. But here's the deal. If you were to run out of your camp and sneak off with a Moabite, there was no way that you could have any kind of sexual relationship with the Moabite without worshiping their gods. Can I tell you this? It's the same thing with you looking at pornography. I'm sorry, and I'm not casting stones at you. I'm telling you what it is. You cannot be a part of pornography without bowing down to the God of that thing. And you're gonna to have to decide how you wanna live. So here's what happened during that time. Man, a plague broke out. Just like what's happening in our camp today, just like what's happening in America today, a terrible plague broke out. And so like, okay, what are we gonna do? Man, Moses starts to lay down the law. I mean, this is a really big deal. And then all of a sudden the priesthood was like, no, no, man, you know, we're, gonna, we're, we're all gonna stand with God and we're gonna believe God. But then the, poli the, the political leaders, particularly the leader of the tribe of Simeon, he's like, no, we're gonna double down because we're gonna be called haters if we start hating on all these mobile women. And what's real, it's already in our camp, it's already in our houses. No, here's what I'm gonna do. I am gonna go to the Moabite uh, main tribal leader and I'm going to take his wife and I'm going to march her through camp and go, this is what we're signing up for. And there's no consequences to this. Nobody can hold us accountable. If we want to live like this, we get to live like this and we are bringing it into the camp. They were political leaders and everybody didn't know what to do. And this political leaders came down saying, no, we're actually going to live like this. And not only are we gonna live like this, we're going to live like this in broad daylight and the camp needs to deal with it. 
So they go off into the tent. Now, at this time, while there's this huge political sexual uprising, everybody's like, what do we do, what do we do? Aaron had a grandson and the priesthood rose up and that brother went and got a spear and walked in the tent and went boom through both of them. Then he takes out the tent, throws it out and says, that's what I'm doing with this trash every single time it shows up in my camp. That's what I'm doing. And priesthood can do that when the political leadership rises up. Friends, I wanna just tell you this, guys, ladies, I wanna just tell you this. Hey, listen, every single time that trash comes into your house, peg it to the floor and uncover the tent. And you know what you do? This is what I do, okay? Honestly, when I get that filth that comes on my phone, I nail it down and go, no. I'm not gonna let this trash into my heart and into my mind. And I wanna tell you this, ladies, I don't know that, I don't know that any woman can identify with what I'm gonna say. There are sometimes I will see a picture that is so crazy to me. It's like somebody takes a needle and jams it in my neck and just inject me with something. And I can feel it in every single part of my body. I'm like, what? No, that's how dudes are. Dudes are visual. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, just stop, just stop, 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 stop. I'm not gonna have that trash in my life. And this is what I'm gonna do, boom. I go, this is what I'm gonna do every single time that any form of pornography comes into my life. And then I uncover it. Leanna, look at this trash that keeps coming to my phone. Hey, hey, Jerry, Pastor Jerry, do I do this? With all the leadership. Hey guys, be advised, this kind of trash is coming to my phone today. I uncover it. Amen. That's what I do. Me and Leanna got an awesome relationship. She's not mad at me because trash comes to me. Trash comes to all of us. She gets that stuff all the time. And it's like, okay, well, what did you do? You own a phone. That's what you did. And somebody that you trusted sold your phone number to somebody else. And so, okay, so like, all right, so, so what I do, if that trash comes into your camp, you cannot go along with the political view of that. You go along with the priesthood view of it. And you take a spear and you peg it right through the middle of it and then uncover of it and go, okay, I dealt with that. And I'm like, well, that's, that's pretty, guys, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you this. I wanna just talk to the men here for a minute. Guys, I wanna tell you something about that lady you're with. Um, ladies, just close your ears. You can actually work it to your advantage to do that. Because see, if you guys will work on your relationship this way, you can call your bride the way I call my bride if I'm watching a movie or if I see something and something comes on there and I shouldn't see and I, I you know what? I'll call her and tell her, okay, I had, listen, I started watching this movie and I wanna tell you it's got a bunch of trash in it about uh, 90 minutes into it and I shut it all down. And she'll be like, that's, that's a good boy because see man, she wants a husband like that. Then I'll be like, I'll be home in 10 minutes. Because I know that woman is going to want to love on me because she loves the fact that I have a covenant with her. I will not look at another woman's naked body. I'm not gonna do that. And it's not just a part of being grown up that you have to look at pornography, even if it's just in simple entertainment, just watching a movie or something, and just a God awful scene come on there. Like, no, I don't gotta look at that. I have a wife that I promised that I would not lust after other women. And, and guys, if I'm not willing to keep that, don't think for once, if I don't care about my own family, do not think I do not, do not think that I give a rip about your, about your family. I would, I wanna encourage these guys, every single person that is in here, and just encourage you and just say this, that the Spirit of the Lord is with you to walk in the spirit and in truth, even in the midst of your own sexuality, while a whole world is trying to redefine that for you. Don't let them do that. Don't let them have your kids. I wanna encourage you to make a stand as awkward as it is. You might ought to actually say to your wife or to your kids or mom, if you're the problem, actually say to your husband, I wanna make a covenant with you. I will never allow that into my camp again. I cannot be a part of that. Ladies, for all you ladies that you have been, you have been sexualized in such a way that you believe you don't even know how to be sexual unless, you know, what's portrayed in pornography is the way that you act. I'm so sorry for that. 
really and truly, I'm so sorry, and I mean that. <laughs> here's, what I like to, here's what I like to say to you, be set free, and then go about the business of setting your entire camp free. Learn the language to speak to your kids, and it starts off when they're little bitty, good pictures, bad pictures. Not letting them have, the media have them 24 hours a day to actually learn real relationships that, hey man, when you get in trouble, if you look at something or if you're part of something that you shouldn't be a part of, you can talk to me about it. We're gonna deal with it, but I'm not gonna hate your guts. This is something we have to deal with in our society now. And I would just say this too, the Lord will bless you. He will bless you and you'll have what it is that you're looking for in somebody else's life. Let's give King Jesus a great big praise, amen. Awesome.